On the left, Van Jones. On the right, S.E. Cup in the crossfire. Maria Cardona, a Democratic strategist. And Ralph Reed, chairman of the Faith and Freedom Coalition. When our leaders find the middle, will they lose their base? Tonight on Crossfire. Welcome to Crossfire. I'm Essie Cup on the right. And I'm Van Jones on the left. In the Crossfire tonight, we've got strategists from both political parties. Now, a few hours ago, President Obama met with the top Democratic senators to start planning the strategy for the midterm elections. Here's a little tip. Think Seattle, not Denver, oh. okay? <laughs> midterm <laughs> elections are about playing defense. That means keep your base happy. Here's my playbook. First, reject the Keystone Pipeline. You got a brand new report out that reveals it creates, get this, 35 permanent jobs. Now, Seattle scored more points than that last night. Next, demand a <laughs> path to citizenship for immigration reform. Don't let the Republicans push you around like the Seahawks did Peyton Manning last night. Stand your ground on that. And third, get rid of this terrible, sellout, awful trade deal, this Trans-Pacific thing. Nobody in your base wants that. You are already polling, Mr. President, at 45%. If you want to get to 35%, abandon your base in the middle of a midterm election. Well, so you worked a lot of football into that. I, into that I, got, I liked it. I got skills. And I hope the president's <laughs> listening. We know he watches Crossfire. I hope he takes your advice. Okay. In the Crossfire tonight, Democratic strategist Maria Cardona and Faith and Freedom Coalition President Ralph Reed. We've got a lot to talk about tonight. Let's start with the Democrats. We're going to get to the Republicans, but for now, let's let's focus on the Democrats. And Maria, I, Van clearly <laughs> wants to push the president to the left, to, to, wants to the president the to reach out to those progressives. But look at the president's approval ratings in the most competitive states for the Senate this year. He is not doing well in red states where Democrats are vulnerable. Wouldn't it be suicide for the president to take Van's advice, which is why I want him to? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it would be suicide. And, and I think the reason is because a lot of the issues that Van mentioned and there are a lot of the issues that the president talked about when he was inaugurated for the second time in his inauguration speech, which so many people talked about how it was such a lefty liberal speech. If you look at each one of those issues, immigration reform, climate change, uh, minimum wage, even how he's talking about income inequality right now, the majority of the American people, the mainstream of America, are there. They are with him. Now, there's no question that it will be a tightrope because, as we know, in midterm elections, it is not a national electorate. You have to look at what's going on in those states. And that's why you see some of these red state Democrats are doing their own thing. And that's yeah, okay. They want to be seen with him in that's, public. That, that, that's okay yeah. because they know what they need to do in order to get elected. It, it actually means that the president can do all of the, the things that Van Jones well, talked well, about. Good. I and gives them an opportunity to, to show the difference. But let's bring you in here. Uh, wouldn't you concede on some of this stuff? Maybe you don't like everything I just said, but there's a lot of stuff this president has led on, the public's with him on, and now even Republicans are moving. Immigration, uh, minimum wage, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, the debt ceiling, clean debt ceiling. All these are things where Obama stuck the, the, the pole in the ground, mm -hmm. and now Republicans are moving his way. Isn't that a vindication of his leadership? No. I, I, <laughs> I, I am think, shocked. I think the problem is, and, and SC showed the, uh, the president's uh, plummeting approval ratings in, in the key red states where the, where the, the key Senate races mm -hmm. will take place. But th this is an approval rating that has plummeted from the high 50s to mid 50s down to the low 40s. And, and I really think, Van, you're making it more complicated and more political than it really needs to be. This is really largely because of a policy failure. The central domestic legislative achievement of this president, the domestic legislative achievement will de that will define his presidency in the same way that the Great Society did for LBJ and the New Deal. Are you going to say for Obamacare? Yeah. <laughs> Obamacare. I think that's yeah. Yeah. The Republican is talking about Obamacare. Failure, okay? Yeah. And, and even he has acknowledged that. The broken website, the five to six million people who had their policies canceled. And all that, that catastrophe, to use uh, Bacchus, Senator Baucus's mm -hmm. term, a train wreck. So, so instead of focusing on the politics, the key is to get the policy right. I, now, if you look at immigration reform, for example, let's, I know this is hard in Washington, <laughs> but let's set the politics aside for a minute and ask ourselves a simple question. Is it a good idea, is it sound policy, to tell millions of people who have been waiting in line for years 
to obey our laws, to play by the rules, and to wait for a legal visa before they enter, to watch millions of people be given a green light to a special path to citizenship when they obeyed the law. Well, we're going to get and into the answer is it's not. Reform, but yeah. Go ahead, Maria. You okay. Can respond. So first of all, on, Ob on Obamacare, um, Ralph, you're just wrong on that because. It's way too early to say one way or the other what his legacy is going to be. But the numbers show, now that the website is working, that it actually will be, on average, very good for the American people. You have millions of people who could not get health care before who are now getting it. And a lot of the people that you talk about whose plans were canceled are now able to get them perhaps at cheaper rates and perhaps at different plans that are better for them. You talk about the coalition of voters that a, any Republican who, has to, who wants to be in the White House anytime soon they have to look at women, they have to look at Latinos, they have to look at African Americans. That coalition of voters, they are absolutely doing well by Obamacare and will continue to do well because they're the ones who didn't have health care before. Not, not Republicans were not doing yeah, not, not, not if not an, enough young people sign up to actually make Obamacare affordable and workable. I mean, you might have some good polling results right now mm -hmm. from the folks who actually got Obamacare. But we don't have the numbers to actually support this system. Doesn't that worry you? Well, yeah, yes, and, and it is a worry, and that's why you see all of the groups that uh, are allied with the president making sure that they go out and they sign up those young people. But even, even the early numbers are, are higher than what was expected. But well, actually, numbers. actually, what, well, the early, on, what, the early numbers, what the early numbers show, Maria, and this is both in a New York Times report and a Wall Street Journal report, in which they surveyed private insurers who are signing up people on the exchanges. Mm -hmm. Between 80 and 85 percent of the people who are getting policies are people mm -hmm. who have had their policies canceled. So Obamacare is not succeeding in covering the uninsured. All it's doing is churning through, canceling people's policies, but then they're driven to the exchanges, and now they're having to get a new policy. That's not what this uh, Obamacare was supposed to do. And I, th I think, I think in, in addition to Obamacare, which a lot of voters care about, they sure. also care about jobs. And if we're serious about jobs, I think that the president has got to approve the Keystone Pipeline. You've got major union labor union folks backing this. President Clinton said we've got to embrace Keystone. It just got a clean bill of health in this report. Haven't yeah. the opponents to Keystone <laughs> Already lost. I bet. No. I bet the president yeah. approves no. this. No. You want to make a bet? Absolutely sure. not. I, I will bet you. Okay, great. You know, Let's I, do it. I, I won't bet you my retirement, but I will bet you. <laughs> Let's stay away from ten thousand dollar bets. <laughs> that's right. That's but, right. Uh, <laughs> we'll just we'll shake on it. How about we'll that? Shake on it. Good. <laughs> um, the, if you look at the report, the report doesn't actually say that this is going to be good for the country. What the report actually says is that in and of itself, you cannot make a determination on the impact of what this one project by itself, without any other factor coming into play, will have on carbon emissions. What it does say, though, is it plays out scenarios which are, which are very feasible that will play out. For example, the price of oil goes down. Everyone's speculating that the price of oil will, will go down. If that happens, then tar sands expands and carbon emissions will go up. And so I actually think taking that along with everything else that the president wants to do on climate change can give him a green light to say no. I, I really want to get your opinion on this now. I don't understand why Republicans have made this project the centerpiece of their entire economic philosophy. When you look I at think the that's actual... overstated quite a bit. <laughs> well, every, every time we have a show, somebody says something. Somebody says, somebody says something the about Keystone. Of our economic and somehow, philosophy. somehow Keystone is going to create all these jobs. Well, and then it turns out, look, let's just build right. the actual numbers. It turns out the actual numbers are 3,000 tempor 3, temporary jobs in the construction sector and 35 permanent jobs. Mm -hmm. Why is this this obsession that you guys have when you have a foreign corporation, TransCanada, who's going to be seizing American farmland, putting a dangerous toxic chemical through so they can send it over to China and create 35 permanent jobs? Why is this your talking point? Well, I, I don't think that's a fair reading of the report. First of all, the report says there will be 42,000 jobs created. Oh, no, no, no. It said, it said let's be very clear, 42,000 jobs, direct, indirect, and yeah, induced. Yeah, that's right. Which is basically the well, secretary that, that's just a, that, No, that's, that's an econometric model that shows the spending of people who get jobs and so forth. It isn't fair to just limit it But it's 3,900 well, construction jobs. By that's, definition. I can give you, I can give ban, you that any other ban, Go ahead. Ban. By definition, construction jobs are temporary. Okay? When you build a building, guess what? When the building's built, you move on to the next project. It's ridiculous to say you shouldn't build a pipeline for that reason. That's number one. Number two, 
The main argument given for why the pipeline should not have been green-lighted was its potential effect on the environment. Right. Mm -hmm. And what the report shows, Van, and this is irrefutable, the science is clear, is that the alternatives to the pipeline are worse if you use primarily tanker trucks to, to uh, transport this, uh, this shale gas. Mm -hmm. Uh, climate uh, emissions will be 28% higher than the pipeline. If you use primarily rail, they'll be 40 to 42% higher. So okay. if very you're protecting the environment, <laughs> okay. you should all build the, the pipeline. All that's a very good reason to leave this toxic sludge in the ground. We can talk about that later. <laughs> all right, so Democrats have happen. their own little feuds, but Republicans have their own share of divides too. When it comes to immigration, I'm convinced we're having the wrong debate. I've got some numbers that will surprise you next.